All right. Our scripture reading is going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verses 14 to 17. Please stand with me in honor of God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 14 to 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. May the Lord be blessed by the reading and hearing of his word. Please be seated. As we begin this morning, on the bottom of your notes for the message today are three questions. And I want us to be thinking about these as we go through the passage this morning. Question number one, what is at the center of my life? What is at the center of my life? Question number two, do I believe and declare the clear gospel? Do I believe and declare the clear gospel? Question number three, how is Christ transforming me? How is Christ transforming me? So what is at the center of my life? Do I believe and declare the clear gospel? How is Christ transforming me? Let's pray. Father, we come now to your precious holy word. And I pray that we would have open hearts to receive what you have for us today. Father, I pray that you would use me as your tool and instrument to communicate the truth of your word to the people that you have brought here today. I pray that, Father, we would be transformed as we are conformed to the image of Christ. We thank you, we praise you, we look forward to what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. What does it mean to be committed to something? I remember the first time that I learned how to kneeboard. Now, for those of you who don't know, kneeboarding is when you go out on the lake and you're pulled behind a boat and you get on this little board. It's about a quarter size of a surfboard, right? And you get on it and you get on your knees and you strap yourself to this board. And so I remember the first time that I learned how to do this, we get out and after a few tries, I was able to get up on the surface of the water and we're cruising along and I started to get more confident, right? And so I'm going to go over and I'm going to jump the wake of the boat, right? And so I jump up into the air, and as I do it, my weight shifts forward, and the nose of the board goes straight down and just dives into the water, right? And so I'm holding on to this rope, and I dive straight into the water, and as I do this, I forget one very, very important thing. I keep holding on to the rope. And so I'm draining dragged under the water like a submarine with this thing until it finally, the rope gets pulled out of my hand. Right. Now, that is kind of a picture of commitment. When we are committed, we hold on even when it feels like we're drowning. Right? We hold on. History provides us with ample evidence of commitment. One of the most famous examples would be Thomas Edison. He failed over a thousand times to create a light bulb. And when he was asked about it, he said, well, no, I didn't fail a thousand times. I just learned a thousand times how not to make a light bulb. <laughs> that is one form of commitment. Persistence in the face of difficulty. However, there's another form of commitment. There is a book besides the Bible that I think every Christian should read, and that is Fox's Book of Martyrs by John Fox. The book begins with the martyrdom of the apostles and it works its way through history recording many instances where Christians gave their lives because of their commitment to Christ and their unwillingness to compromise the gospel. I want to just share one brief story with you from page 40 of this book. In the year 304, when the persecution reached Spain, Dacian, the governor of Tarragona, ordered Valerius the bishop and Vincent the deacon to be seized, loaded with irons, and imprisoned. The prisoners being firm in their resolution, Valerius was banished and Vincent was racked, his limbs dislocated, his flesh torn with hooks. 
He was laid on a gridiron, which not only had fire placed under it, but had spikes at the top, which ran into his flesh. These torments neither destroying him nor changing his resolutions. He was remanded to prison and confined in a small, loathsome, dark dungeon, strewed with sharp flints and pieces of broken glass, where he died in, on January 22nd, 304. His body was then thrown into the river. There's one particular phrase that I find so powerful here. It says, these torments neither destroying him nor changing his resolutions. He was remanded to prison. That is commitment. Commitment to the cross of Jesus Christ has a high cost. Are we willing to? pay. As the body of Christ, we must be committed to the cross, and when we're committed to the cross, we keep Christ the center, and we keep the gospel simple. As Paul writes the Corinthians here, he's arguing against their sectarianism. They've been separated themselves based on what teacher they like best, and Paul has begun to correct the error in their thinking by giving them three reminders. We looked last week at how Christ is not divided. Paul was not crucified for them, and they were not baptized in Paul's name. Now he takes these reminders a step further by giving them a proper emphasis on baptism and distinguishing between salvation and baptism. We are not to be committed to people. We are not to be committed to baptism. We're to be committed to the cross. Being committed to the cross brings transformation and bold proclamation. And so to be committed to the cross, Paul challenges the Corinthians to take two actions. Action number one, emphasize the centrality of Christ. <coughs> emphasize the centrality of Christ. What do a Cadbury egg, a custard-filled donut, a volcano, a Hot Pocket, and a burrito all have in common? It's what's at the center that counts, right? It's what's at the center that counts. Anyone who's ever taken a bite out of a fake fruit knows this, that what's in the middle matters, right? I, several of our children have taken bites out of styrofoam fruit or brought us some uh, a fruit from a store. Wow, this looks so yummy, right? But it's fake because what's in the middle matters, right? It's what's at the center that counts. As a child, I think all of us or many of us ate Tootsie Pops, right? Was there anyone else who would try to crunch up the, the hard part as fast as you can so that you could get to the, the good stuff? Right? Or maybe you had a, a, one of those um, bubble gum pops where you, you get rid of the outside. and It's what's in the middle that you were so excited about, right? What's in the middle matters. What's at the center counts. I am one of those people who I don't like solid chocolate bars. I want there to be something in the middle, right? Uh, just a solid piece of chocolate doesn't appeal to me. The Christian life is like this. Believers in Jesus Christ are direct described as his body. He's the head. The head is the most important part of the body because it controls everything else. Anytime the head is not in control, a dangerous situation is created. Paul's reminding these believers, he's reminding this church, Christ is supposed to be central to the church and to Christian life. The reality is, is that when I place myself ahead of Christ, I make the cross useless. And that's what Paul is going to emphasize here. So how do we emphasize the centrality of Christ? We adjust our focus. Paul gives us two things to focus on here, two ideas. Idea number one, focus on the declaration. Focus on the declaration. Look at verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. It says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Now let me mention who these men are. Crispus was the ruler of the synagogue before Sosthenes. And if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about Sosthenes, who is with Paul when he writes this letter. But before Sosthenes was the ruler of the synagogue, Crispus was the ruler of the synagogue. He came to Christ and got replaced. Okay? So that's who Crispus is. We read about him in Acts 18. Gaius became a companion of Paul. Apparently, he hosted the church at Corinth. He's mentioned in Acts and in Romans and possibly in 3 John. Paul says, I baptized these two men. Now, he mentioned baptize, baptism in verse 13. He said, you weren't baptized in the name of Paul. right? And then he says, actually, I only baptized a couple of you. Why is he saying that? Because he's emphasizing that who baptized you is not important. Right? The act of baptism is what's important, not who doesn't. Right? That is his 
point. So he says, I thank God that I only baptized a couple of you. Why? Because if he had baptized more people in the church, it would have intensified the conflict. Right? Can you just picture it with me? Right? Well, I was baptized by Paul. <laughs> I was baptized by Apollos. Guys, guys. I was baptized by Peter. Yeah. Right? You, the conflict was bad enough without them being able to say, well, I was baptized by Paul. So Paul says, I'm thankful that I didn't baptize very many of you. He's not saying this because baptism is not important. We'll talk a little bit more about this. The point is that who baptized you doesn't really matter. When someone is baptized, they're making a declaration of faith. But that, it's what's happening that is important. It shouldn't be about who baptized them. Rather, it should be about the statement that they're making. That's why we're saying focus on the declaration, the statement that they're making. We are to focus on the declaration, on what baptism means, not on the baptism itself. Why? Because baptism isn't about you. And it's not about who baptizes you. It's about Christ. It's about the believer identifying himself, himself or herself with Christ. Paul doesn't want them to those in Corinth to say these things that, and have it be all about him, right? He doesn't want their baptism to be about Paul. <laughs> With that thought in mind, it's important to understand what baptism is and what it is not. This word baptized is the Greek word baptizo, and it means to wash or to purify or dip, to momentarily dip someone into water as a cleansing, ceremonial, and initiatory rite. So we believe here in baptism by immersion, meaning you're placed all the way into the water. Why do we believe that? Because that's what the word means. Okay? And because that's what was practiced in Jesus' time. And because baptism is a symbol of our death and resurrection with Christ. When someone is baptized, it's a public declaration of their desire to follow Christ. It's asking all those in the local church to hold them accountable for their faith. Because of what baptism is, the biblical model is for believers to be baptized by immersion. Paul offers thanksgiving in verse 12, 14 because he only baptized Crispus and Gaius. Why? Because who baptized you doesn't matter. There are some churches that teach you have to be baptized in their denomination before you can uh, take communion, before you can uh, be a, a part of their church. That's not an idea found in Scripture. If we were baptized as a believer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your baptism is biblical. Others think baptism it needs to be done by a church leader, and that too is not the case. It needs to be done by another believer, not necessarily a leader. Why do I say that? Look at Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We refer to this as the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Here's the question. Is this a commission for all believers, or yes or no? Yeah, it's commission for all believers. So if all believers are supposed to baptize, then any believer can baptize, provided they meet two conditions. Condition number one, both the person being baptized and the person doing the baptism need to have a clear testimony of salvation by faith in Christ. Okay? Condition number two, the baptism must be done as a public declaration of faith in Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, personally, I love it when a father gets to baptize their children. That's something that's just incredible to me. But sometimes a uh, father's not there. Sometimes the father's not a believer. And in that situation, I would not have an objection to the mother baptizing the children. I don't think I could make a biblical case against that. Now, I do think that the local church needs to be involved in the process. Okay? Uh, it's very, because, why? Because it's a public declaration. That's the whole point. Okay? And the believers are holding them accountable. Why are we talking about this? Because Paul's making a point, and the point is, it doesn't matter who baptizes you, what matters is why you're being baptized. Because there's a final false teaching. 
The final false teaching about baptism is that it is a necessary part of salvation. We'll deal with that a little bit more in verse 17, but for now, just think about what Paul says in this verse. If baptism is essential for salvation, then Paul is thanking God that he didn't lead most of them to Christ. Just considering what we know about Paul, would Paul be saying, I'm so glad that most of you aren't saved? Or that I wasn't sure that most of you were saved? No. So baptism is not a part of salvation. Baptism is a part of sanctification. Now we're going to deal with this a little more in verse 17. It's the reality of your baptism that matters, not who does it or what church it was in. If we're to emphasize the centrality of Christ, we cannot be concerned with who did your baptism or where it was done. We must instead concern ourselves with the reality that a follower of Jesus Christ has cho chosen to make a public declaration of faith. They have committed to following Him, walking in obedience to His Word. As their brothers and sisters in Christ, we are now called to help them, support them, confront them, and fight alongside them. Interestingly enough, I've had a couple of different people ask me about baptism this week. Uh, if you are interested in that, if you've never been baptized, if you want more information about that, please come talk to me. I'm hoping to have a baptism Sunday pretty soon. We are committed to the cross. Therefore, we emphasize the centrality of Christ. And when it comes to baptism, the centrality of Christ is seen when we focus on the declaration it makes and not on who's doing it. That's Paul's point. He's saying, I'm thankful that I only baptized a couple of you because I don't want your baptism to be about me. <laughs> Christ needs to be at the center of all that we do. When he's at the center of our personal lives, we have our priorities in order, and we're able to focus on what matters most. When he is at the center of our friendships, we build up our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we point those who are not believers towards Jesus. When he is at the center of our parenting, we will remember that survival is not enough. We must train our children to live out the gospel in a world that is hostile to it. When he's at the center of our marriage, we show a confused world what love really is. Love is commitment when the going is tough. Love is choosing to move forward even when it hurts. Love is unconditional. And so on your paper, when Christ is central, we declare him in every area of life. When Christ is central, we declare him in every area of life. Would you read that with me, please? When Christ is central, we declare him in every area of life. It isn't about people. It's not about leaders. It's not even about ourselves. The Christian life is about Christ. And so as we emphasize the centrality of Christ, we focus on these two ideas. Idea number one, focus on the declaration. It's not about the person doing the baptism. It's about what they're doing, this statement. Idea number two, focus on the dedication. Focus on the dedication Verse 15, verse 15, with the wind picking up, I'm just going to read the verses from my uh, notes here and not, not open my Bible and have the pages flip all over the place. So, uh, verse 15, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. So Paul says, I'm thankful that I only baptized a couple of you, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. The reason for Paul's thanksgiving in verse 14 is here revealed in verse 15. He didn't want to be accused of baptizing in his own name. Paul has Christ at the center of his life and ministry. And because Christ is central, Paul didn't baptize in his own name. Here's the deal. <clears throat> when we make disciples, right, as the Great Commission commands, we are not making disciples of ourselves. Paul's not making disciples of Paul. He's making disciples of Christ. And so he says, I don't want people to think I'm baptizing in my own name. I'm not making Paul followers. I'm making Christ followers. We want believers to become devoted followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, not disciples of Paul, not disciples of John Winkleman, disciples of Christ, followers of Him. He is our Master. He is our Lord. He is our Head. We move at His direction. And this is why it would be a big issue to baptize in your own name. Look at 1 John 2, 3-6. 1 John 2, 3-6. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. 
He who says he abides in, in him ought himself also to walk, just as he walked. So we're called to keep the commandments of Christ. We're to obey the word. We're to abide in Christ. We're to walk as he walked. Your blank there says when Christ is the center of our lives, we are dedicated to him. When Christ is the center of our lives, we are dedicated to him. The goal of baptism is to dedicate someone to Christ. Not to Paul, not to a church, not to a particular denomination, but to Christ. So would you read that with me, please? When Christ is the center of our lives, we are dedicated to him. The Corinthian church needed to be reminded of who exactly they were called to follow. We're called to Christians because we're to be little Christs. Romans 8.29, Paul reveals what we have been predestined for. He says this, Romans 8.29, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Part of the purpose of salvation is conformity to Christ. We're to be like him. And as we emphasize the centrality of Christ, these are the two ideas we focus on. We focus on the declaration. It's not about who baptized you. It's not about where you're baptized. It's about the statement being made, I want to follow Christ. And then we focus <coughs> on the dedication. We are being committed to Christ, following Him. So, if we're going to be committed to the cross, he says you need to take two actions. Number one, emphasize the centrality of Christ. Action number two, embrace the clarity of the gospel. Embrace the clarity of the gospel. If any of the, the kids want to come help me, I could use some volunteers. Any of the kids want to come help me? You, you can be in your socks. I don't care. Joseph, you want to come up? Busy? I need help. All right. I got Everett. I got Silas. Come on, dude. Okay. So, I'm going to give you directions. And you're going to do exactly what I say. Okay. Ready? So I'm going to tell you to do something, and you're going to do exactly what I say. Ready? Go. Turn. Backwards. One leg. Turn. Wave. Pop. Go. Turn. Windmill. Stop. Was that confusing to anyone? <laughs> Why? Why is it confusing? Because you weren't I was not doing anything. Okay. I was just walking. Yeah, you weren't doing anything, right? Because it's confusing, right? I didn't say where to go. I didn't say where to turn. I didn't say which leg to stand on. I didn't say how to do anything. I didn't describe anything, right? See, because when we're not clear, it's confusing. Thank you, guys. You can go sit down. Appreciate it. A lack of clarity inevitably leads to confusion. When the gospel message is not clear, it leaves people in doubt. The result is people are unsure about their salvation and they're confused about their purpose and direction. They're confused about their destination. We don't want people confused. Okay? Now this is a difficult truth, but here it is. When I stray from the clear gospel, I make the cross useless. When I stray from the clear gospel, I make the cross useless. Paul wants there to be absolute clarity on what the gospel is and on what it is not. And to that end, he calls the Corinthian church to make two clarifications. Clarification number one, clarify the priority. Clarify the priority. Verse 16 says, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Later in chapter 16, Paul reveals that Stephanus was the first person saved in the region of Achaia, which is where Corinth is. So, Paul's writing, right, and he says, I baptized Crispus and Gaius, and then he says something he's like, oh wait, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. That's it. For, you know, we don't know how many people are in the household of Stephanus, but two guys in one household. That's who he baptized. And I want to be clear again. He's not emphasizing how few people he baptized because it's not important. Okay? He is striving to help the Corinthian church understand that 
who baptized you is not as important as the baptism itself. You could be baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, and it wouldn't be any more valid if you were baptized in the swimming pool by Tom, right? Okay? Baptism, it's not about who's doing it or where you're doing it, it's about the point, the purpose of baptism. The gospel isn't about baptism. The gospel is about transformation. Look at Colossians 1, 9 to 14. Colossians 1, 9 to 14. Colossians 1, verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Paul says, this is my prayer for you, Colossians. Not that they would be baptized. He assumed that they would. His prayer was that they would live for Christ. Now, baptism is an important part of that. It's a public declaration that we want to follow Jesus. It's kind of a stake in the ground. I belong to Christ, and I want all of you to know it. It's also giving permission to the local body of Christ to check up on you. Right? It's saying, look, I'm declaring that I want to follow Christ, and so if you see me not walking with Christ, call me on it. Right? Because we belong to Christ, it changes our minds. Paul prays for knowledge and wisdom and spiritual understanding. Knowing Christ changes our activity. Paul says we walk worthy. We want to please the Lord. We bear spiritual fruit as we do good works and grow in the knowledge of God. It changes our ability. Christ gives us strength to be patient and long-suffering with joy. It changes our outlook. We're now thankful because of what God has for us. We have an inheritance. It changes our allegiance. We're taken from the power of darkness to the kingdom of Christ. It changes our status. We're no longer guilty. We are redeemed and forgiven. Paul doesn't emphasize baptism because baptism is not the point of the gospel. The gospel is about a change of destination. It's a transfer of kingdoms, right? It's a transfer of citizenship. It's about a shift in our identity. We were headed one way, right? And then we're headed the opposite direction. That's what salvation is about. That's what the gospel is about. We are completely, absolutely, unequivocally, and irreversibly changed. We were going towards destruction. Now we go towards life. That's the point that Paul wants to make. The, his ministry is not about baptism. It's about the gospel. It's about the life transformation that happens when Christ becomes the center of our lives. And so, your blank there says the priority of the gospel is the transformation of the believer. The priority of the gospel is the transformation of the believer. Would you read that with me, please? The priority of the gospel is the transformation of the believer. Have you been transformed? Has the gospel impacted your personal life? Here's what I mean. When we come to Jesus, the entire purpose of our existence changes. That change is then manifested in our lives. Maybe we used to live for parties and supposedly good times offered by the pleasures of the world. Once we're saved, we no longer live for our own pleasure. We live to please Christ. What pleases Christ, as we saw in 1 John, is obedience to his word. Has the gospel impacted your friendships? This doesn't mean we refuse to talk to our friends about anything other than Jesus. What it means is that our friends understand what the most important thing in our lives is. Because of how we treat them, because of how the love of Christ is obvious in our lives, our friends ask us the reason of the hope that's in us. Has the gospel impacted your parenting? Many parents only want to survive until their kids leave the house. I just want, I just want to survive. Right? And then you have grandkids. And then you realize survival is not going to happen. Right? <laughs> There's this thinking that I just want to get through this next event, through this next time. But that's not what we're called to do. Scripture calls us to parent intentionally, 
to train and prepare our children to live for Christ in a world that rejects Him. And that means we have to teach our children personal responsibility. It means we have to teach them boundaries. It means we have to teach them that there's consequences for our actions. Has the gospel impacted your marriage? The commitment a Christian makes in marriage is till death do us part. We are a picture of Christ in the church. This means we forgive. It means we love. It means we correct. We respect and we grow together. This is the practical side of what Paul is saying. It's where the rubber meets the road. Baptism is a part of the priority of the gospel, but it's not the whole thing. The gospel changes our lives. The gospel changed the life of Stephanus. Look, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 15 says this, I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I love this. Stephanus comes to Christ. He's the first one in, in this whole kind of like county, right, to come to Christ, his, his family. And it says they devoted themselves to the ministry. It changed their lives. It changed their direction. It changed their purpose. This family that Paul baptized became devoted to ministry. The gospel changed their lives. How is the gospel changing you and me? So there's two clarifications that we need as we embrace the clarity of the gospel. We need to clarify the priority. The priority of the gospel is not baptism. The priority of the gospel is life change, right? We're, we're changed. Our destination is changed, right? Our, our purpose has changed. Everything has changed when we come to Christ. But secondly, we need to clarify the presentation. Clarify the priority. Clarify the presentation. Verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So this is the capstone of this section. Paul says, God did not send me to baptize. He's out there, he's proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and there's several things that I want to look at here. First, Paul was sent. This word send is the Greek word apostello, and it means to send out, to dispatch, to send away towards a designated goal or purpose. Paul says, I have been dispatched with a designated goal and purpose. He's been sent by Christ, sent by the Messiah, by the anointed one. He has a commission given to him by his master. This is not something to be ignored. It is not to be taken lightly or treated carelessly. It's a responsibility given by Almighty God. What is it? What's the responsibility he's been given? Well, first he tells us what it isn't. <laughs> he says it's not to baptize. Paul's calling, his commission from God, is not to baptize. This word um, is the, the next word. So he says not to baptize, and then there's a little conjunction here, right? And it is an adversative conjunction. What that means is Paul uses this word to present a contrast. Instead of being sent to baptize, he's being sent to preach the gospel. Now, we believe that every single word of Scripture is inspired, right? We believe in what's called verbal plenary inspiration. Verbal means every single word. Plenary means it's all equally inspired. And this is one of the reasons why. This little word, this little conjunction, is, defeats an entire false teaching of baptismal regeneration. It's an adversative conjunction, okay? It means, uh, you, he says, baptismal regeneration, so let me clarify that. Baptismal regeneration is the teaching that you have to be baptized in order to be saved, okay? That um, if you're not baptized, you're not saved, okay? And we don't believe that's true. And this verse right here teaches that's not true. He says, God sent me not to baptize, but in contrast to that, to preach the gospel. What's he saying? Baptism is not part of the gospel. Is that clear? That's why this one little word is so important. Because it's a contrast. He's saying, it's not, I'm, I'm sent to not to baptize, but in contrast to preach the gospel. Baptism is not part of the gospel. It is not necessary for salvation. Therefore, to be clear, a gospel presentation should not include baptism. Baptism is something to be discussed with someone after they have trusted in Christ. Scripture is clear that baptism is something done by believers and for believers. And it is said you, you need to do it. Every believer should be baptized. But not to be saved, but because they are saved. Exactly. It's a testimony to a world. It's saying... it's Now, in our day and age, unfortunately, it loses some of its significance... 
because back then uh, it was it was a, it was a rebaptism. Baptism was part of the Jewish culture, right? and so it's, so it's saying I'm rejecting that stuff and I'm choosing this stuff. And that's what it's supposed to be. Right? One of my favorite baptisms I was ever a part of was in a public pool, and we're over here in our corner uh, baptizing people, and there's kids swimming around and people going, "What are they doing?" Right? So what does the pastor do? Just quiet. Oh shh, everyone quiet. Don't get over. No. Gospel, loud and clear. What are we doing over here? Well, we're baptizing this person because they have placed their faith in Christ. Why don't you give your testimony right there in the public yeah. pool? Yeah. It was awesome. That's how it is in Italy. Yeah. In the sea. Lots of countries, right, when they, yeah. where they don't have uh, baptismals in their churches, they do it in public. It's a public declaration of faith. And so the gospel is not baptism. So then Paul says, so that's the first qualifier. He says, not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. <laughs> then there's a second qualifier. The gospel is not a script crafted by human wisdom. It is not with wisdom of words. This particular word translated wisdom has the idea of finite wisdom or ability. That's what Peter refers to in 2 Peter 1.16. 2 Peter 1.16, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So the gospel is not a formula that you follow. It's not an eloquent speech that the, the disciples had cobbled together. It wasn't, well, you say this, 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 and this, and then people are magically saved. No. It's, it's it personal. It's individual. There are things that need to be part of the gospel presentation, but it's not this uh, series of, of words, and as long as we get all the right words in there, then they're baptized. I read an article this week about a guy who found out that when he was uh, in, in the Catholic Church, when he was baptized as an infant, they used one of the wrong words. And he said, my whole ministry is, is, is in question now. Because they used one wrong word when I was baptized. It's, it's not about the words that are being said. It's about the commitment of the heart. Same with the gospel. It's not, it's not that we've got to get all the words right, and if we don't get all the words right, then oh no, they're not really saved. It's about what Christ is doing in their heart and in their life. Paul's been sent by God to preach the clear gospel message. He was not sent to baptize. He was not sent to deliver a bunch of carefully crafted words. Paul ends the verse by declaring that when we make the gospel about baptism or about specific words, we make the cross useless. This phrase, should be made of no effect, is one word in the Greek. It's the Greek word kanao. And it means to empty, to render void, to be nullified, to be made or become devoid of significance or point, to become pointless. He's saying the cross is pointless. It is useless if we make it about anything other than Christ. If all salvation requires is a dip in water or a particular set of words, then Christ died for nothing. Salvation doesn't come through baptism. Salvation doesn't come through the words of human wisdom. Salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Your blank there says the clear gospel is salvation by grace through faith. The clear gospel is salvation by grace through faith. Would you read that with me, please? The clear gospel is salvation by grace through faith. Paul wants the Corinthian believers to be reminded that salvation is not about who baptized you. It's not about what Christian leader you like best. Salvation is about the cross of Jesus Christ. What is the cross? The cross is an instrument of suffering and death. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. We must stop wasting our energy on arguments that don't matter. That's what Paul's telling him. But quit arguing about which guy you like best. This is about Christ. The gospel is not baptism. The gospel is not fancy words. The gospel is the cross of Jesus Christ. And so our three words that we be three questions we began with, what is at the center of my life? Do I believe and declare the clear gospel? How is Christ transforming me? As we went through the message, we mentioned a few areas of commitment. Let me just state a few thoughts. In my personal life, when Christ transforms my life, I am no longer concerned about comfort. I'm focused on pleasing Christ. A commitment here could be taking the first step to remove an area of, my, of sin or compromise in my life. Relationships. A friend should be able to tell that I love Christ by how I treat others and how I interact with them. A commitment here could be asking a trusted friend how we might improve in this area. And then when they answer, don't get offended. Act on what they say. 
parenting, being committed to the cross and transformed by Christ means we are intentional in our parenting. We're not just surviving, we're training and equipping. A commitment here could be choosing a practical Bible truth to work with your kids on. Now, I'm going to warn you, if you do this with your kids or grandkids, they're going to start pointing it out and you don't have it. Let me give you a really practical example. Saying kind words. When you start to work with your kids or grandkids on saying kind words, you know what they're going to do? They're going to go, hey, you didn't say a kind word here. We have to be willing to change too. It's not just teaching them, right? Because it's not taught, it's taught. Marriage. Being committed to the cross and to Christ means we don't get the option of bailing on a marriage just because it's hard. As we're being transformed by Christ, we do the hard work of marriage. A commitment here could be putting the time to talk with your spouse on the calendar and then making sure it happens. I'm going to give you just a few moments to write down a commitment. It, again, it doesn't have to be one of the things I said. It can be anything from the message. But our goal is to write down a commitment, to share it with someone, so that we don't just hear the word, but do the word. Are we committed to the cross? If we are, then we keep Christ central and the gospel simple. Four last things. A transformed life has Christ at the center. A transformed life boldly proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our lives are transformed as we read the word, obey the word, and spend time in prayer. So be committed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the reminders in it that we need to be committed to you, committed to the cross of Christ. And I pray that we would be. I pray that, Father, the gospel would be clear in our lives. Who Christ is would be clear in our lives, in our friendships, in our parenting, in our marriages, that Christ would be the center. I ask, Father, that you would guide and you would direct. We ask that this week everything we do, everything we say, and everything we think would bring praise and honor and glory to you in your name. We pray this in Jesus' precious name.